done. Please welcome me and join uh, welcome Bono to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Brian. A gentleman in a world where, uh, where that quality is not always on tap. Very special man. We're, we're thrilled. Um, the band are thrilled. They wanted me to say thank you to, um, to you also, Brian, because uh, the band are committed, as you heard, to, to the idea that every school kid in Ireland will have access to uh, free music lessons if they, if they need them. So, um, so Brian has been helping us out with, uh, with that, uh, along with Loretta Glucksman and the American Ireland Fund. Uh, thanks, of course, especially to President DeJoya, who has made me feel so welcome here, and, and to Dean Thomas of the McDonough School of Business, and to JT, right there, <laughs> who's uh, learning the chords of Sunday Bloody Sunday instead of doing his homework. That's uh, <laughs> the President's son. Um, <laughs> All right, JT. And Amu Menon. Amu Menon. Uh, you, know, with, with, you know, look at that. It's, it, this is going to, this is the spirit and uh, that is going to change the world. Uh, you have it in here, in this room. You can feel it. And what a room it is, by the way. <laughs> wow. I mean, you two has played some nice halls. <laughs> I don't know if this is like a... Uh, a lectern or a pulpit, but uh, <laughs> I feel oddly comfortable. Uh, it's a bit of a worry, isn't it? Um, so, welcome to Pop Culture Studies 101. Please take out your notebooks. Today we're going to discuss why rock stars should never ever be given the microphone at institutions of higher learning. You will receive no credits for taking this class. Not even street cred, it's too late for that. I will, of course, be dropping the odds, you know, cultural reference to give the impression that I know what you, you know, where your generation is at. I do not. I am not sure where I am at. And uh, the first existential question in this class uh, might be, what am I doing in Healy Hall? I could be down uh, having my third pint at the tombs. <laughs> Pop culture references. Rockstar does research. And I heard, I heard that election night uh, was quite messy on the pint front. Uh, isn't it amazing how three pints can make everything seem like a victory, but four or five and you just know you're about to taste defeat. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, congratulations are in order. Um, you know, not just for um, you know for turning out in, in record numbers uh, and forgetting politics for a minute, but for, for for electing an extraordinary man as president. I think you have to say that, whatever your political tradition. But also, <laughs> you, you you are finally free from the tyranny of negative advertising <laughs> from both sides. Those attack ads, can you, could you bear any more of it by the end? Can you imagine what it would be like if we did this for everything, you know, all the time, attack ads about TV shows, rival smartphone companies, college admissions? <laughs> Hello. We're Georgetown and we approve this message. Let me say a few words about some other fine schools you might be considering. <laughs> UVA. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, what have they done to you? <laughs> Syracuse. A school whose mascot is a fruit. <laughs> Duke. Hold on, hold it, hold it, hold it. Duke, a school that worships the devil. Georgetown, you're in with the other guy. Georgetown has God on its side. Everyone knows God is a Catholic, right? <laughs> Two words, Frank Sinatra, that proves it. <laughs> it's okay. 
Anyway, I've been hanging out with politicians more than I should admit, but I guess I don't really get these ads and I don't really understand politics in that form, uh, actually. Uh, I'd like to hear attack ads on things worth attacking. If there was an attack ad on malaria, I'd get that because 3,000 people die every day, mostly kids of malaria. Let's have an attack ad on malaria. Let's have an attack ad on mother to child transmission of HIV AIDS. I'd get that. Choose your enemies carefully because they define you. Make sure they're interesting enough because trust me, you're gonna spend a lot of time in their company. So let's pick a worthwhile enemy, shall we? How about all the obstacles to fulfilling human potential, not just yours or mine, but the world's potential? I would suggest to you that the biggest obstacle in the way right now is extreme poverty. Poverty so extreme it brutalizes, it vandalizes human dignity. Poverty so extreme it laughs at the concept of equality. Poverty so extreme it doubts how far we've traveled in our journey of equality the journey that began with Wilberforce taking on slavery and it will not end until misery and deprivation are in the stocks. Abolitionists, suffragettes, civil rights workers and human rights activists, social movements have always been powerful. But the subject of my speechifying tonight <clears throat> is gonna to point out what is the transformative element about this moment and this generation and the chance that you have to rid the world of the obscenity of extreme poverty. Um, wouldn't that be a hell of a way to start the 21st century? Now, the history department uh, might disagree with me, and I'll admit I only lasted a few weeks in college. Um, <laughs> but I don't believe that the 21st century started in the year 2000 on January 1. For large parts of the world, I think it started in 2011 with the upheaval of the Arab Spring. What happened in Egypt was that the pyramid, the traditional model of power, got inverted. The people at the top got upended and the base had its say. Now the Arab Spring is ongoing, it's messy, it's dangerous and dangerously wrong in some geographies. But what I'm talking about is bigger than Egypt or any place else. It's a massive shift. It's one of those moments that in, in 100 years, the real historians, like those at Georgetown, will write about this phenomenon in the history books. The base of the pyramid, the 99%, is taking more control. The institutions that have always governed our lives, church, state, the mainstream media, music industry, are being bypassed and weakened and seriously tested. People are holding them to account, us to account, demanding that they be more open, more responsive, more effective, or else. Here in the uh, US, you've had the Tea Party hammering big government, you've had Occupy do the same to the Jolly Bankers of Wall Street. Uh, social movements are competing, and we have to hope that the more enlightened ones will win the day. Social movements, like the One Campaign, and we're right, we're 3.2 million people at last count, um, asking the world to pay attention um, to the least amongst us, the very poorest of the world's poor, and the many things we can do to help them. And as, I just, as I'll describe, we'll see uh, things are happening in, in the developing world. Um, but think about this particular moment, uh, not just Facebook in, in the heat of Terrier Square, but the peaceful march across uh, the world of mobile phones, across the parched lands of the Sahel and the dense rainforest of the Congo. Technology is transforming things. Every, everything's speeding up. Everything's opening up. Um, now, if I can talk <coughs> about something I actually know about for a moment, uh, this feeling reminds me a little bit maybe more than a little bit, of the arrival of punk rock in the mid-70s. You see, the Clash were the very base of the rock and roll pyramid, and overnight gave the finger to the dreadful business, the lurgy of the time, that was at the top of the pyramid. It was called progressive rock. Um, epic songs, no good lyrics, no good hooks. Great reviews, 
Um, um, punk bands made no pretense of being better than the audience. Punk bands were the audience. If you wanted to play, great, grab a guitar, you're in the band, virtuosity was out, energy was in. The Clash were like a public service announcement with guitars. And they gave you two um, the idea that social activism could make for a very musical riot. So I'd just like to point out uh, that none of your professors, not a single one, not ever, has ever drawn or is likely to draw the connection between the Arab Spring and the Clash. Uh, <laughs> um, just a little intermission. <clears throat> um, okay. Sharpen your pencils. I don't need to lecture you about change. Change is the air you breathe. You are it. I think change is your expectation. But what might it mean for you when the pyramid and a whole lot else gets turned up on its head, turns upside down on its head? What a huge opportunity that affords you if you're willing to seize it, because there's not just one big lever or lever of power anymore, there's millions of levers or levers. And you've got a lot of them in your hands. And when we press them together at the same time, that's when things really start happening. Um, but first, uh, let, me, let me hit the brakes before, before some of you do. Um, and let's acknowledge that it's brutal out there. It's brutal out there. And by there, I mean here, uh, right here in America. The economy is still in a rough shape, and, 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 and that slashing sound you hear is a big pair of scissors bearing down on the federal budget. Defense cuts, safety net cuts, foreign aid cuts, and all these cuts coming if we drive over this fiscal cliff, so-called. And cuts. They hurt. Somebody bleeds. The aid cut alone would mean that nearly 275,000 people won't get the AIDS treatment they need, resulting in you know, over 60,000 deaths. A quarter of a million more children become AIDS orphans. Real people, real bleeding. So that's why you'll hear us in the one campaign making the case that cuts shouldn't cost lives. Cuts can't cost the lives of the poorest of the poor. It shouldn't be a hard case to make, but it is right now, in the halls of Congress, in the Senate, maybe even here in Healy Hall. But I put it to you, we must not let this economic recession become a moral recession. That would be double cruelty. <laughs> 